Previously this semester we talked about the fact that clays are unique in the fact that they have a negative charge associated with them or generally have a negative charge associated with them. We talked about that way back when we looked at soil texture. Yet we really haven't talked about why that's the case and how that actually develops. Now that we've looked at the construction and the process of formation for our clay minerals, we can actually take a look more at structurally what happens to clays and why they actually end up getting their charge. Well, if we go back and look at our clay minerals and if we look at the building blocks, we have those octahedral sheets and we have those tetrahedral sheets. And the clays are finite. They're huge molecules and we've only really shown a couple of building blocks in each of these diagrams. But if we were to actually, um, you know, look at the molecules themselves, what we're going to find is that there's always going to be an edge. And along that edge, there's always going to be unshared oxygen atoms. And it's because of that that we can end up developing a negative charge because each one of those oxygen atoms has a minus two charge associated with it. So it's not, if its charge is not satisfied, it's going to have a net overall negative charge as a result of those unshared oxygen atoms. That's actually not the only way that clays can get their charge. So let's go back and we're just going to focus on our silicon oxygen tetrahedron. Recognize that this process also occurs in the aluminum octahedron as well. So in our silicon octahedron we had silicon surrounded by four oxygen atoms. Silicon had a plus four charge and every one of those oxygen atoms had a minus two charge. Well what can happen is that there might be other elements that could substitute for silicon. And structurally they're not going to change the clay in any significant manner, but they're going to change the chemistry a little bit. Um, if for some reason magnesium is very common, um, it could go ahead and it could replace, it could literally bump the silicon out and could replace that silicon atom with something else like magnesium. All of this happens based on the size of the atom, so it's not random, the substitution process. There's only certain things that will substitute for other things. Magnesium does happen to be one of the elements that is a common substitution in the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. Well, let's take a look at this a little bit. Silicon has a plus four charge, and magnesium only has a plus two charge. Again, each one of those oxygens have a minus two, so what's going to happen when we substitute with magnesium is we're going to fulfill less of that negative charge and we're going to have a net charge difference of minus two. So the silicon was plus four, the magnesium is only plus two. Overall we have a net charge difference of minus two. That's going to increase the negative charge that's associated with our our clay mineral. So it's not just about the unshared oxygen atoms, it's also about this replacement effect. We call that isomorphic substitution. Okay, if you've taken a chemistry class, or even if you haven't, we can dissect this word a little bit. Iso means similar, morphic means the shape or the structure of something. So similar structure that's being substituted. Okay, here's the technical definition. Isomorphic substitution is the replacement of one atom in a clay mineral by another atom of similar size. And this process happens as a result of environmental conditions. It depends on the abundance of elements, but it's going to happen without disrupting the structure of the clay mineral. So we don't change the type of clay. We don't go from uh, illite to a montmorillonite. We don't go from a two to one to a one to one. None of that change happens. The only thing that occurs is simply that substitution gets made and the overall charge of the clay mineral changes as a result of that substitution. Okay, there are lots of different substitutions that can happen. The prevalence of the substitution is based on the type of clay. So if we take a look at kaolinite, kaolinite was our one-to-one -one clay mineral and it's going to have a net overall charge of I don't know, maybe between a negative one and negative 15. 
negative because it's unshared um, oxygen atoms primarily, and the units here are centimoles of charge per kilogram. Uh, the units aren't really all that important for us right now. Centimoles, basically think of that as the amount of charge per kilogram of soil. So kaolinite has a net overall negative charge. But if we look at illite, it has still a net overall negative charge, but it's more charge. Well, why is that? Well, it's, one, it's a clay that's structurally built a little bit different. It's a two to one, so more substitution can happen. Um, and it's also a little bit expansive, so it makes it easier for those molecules um, to make that substitution process happen. Well, montmorillonite's even more extreme. It's also a two to one, and because of that expansion effect, it's even more prevalent for isomorphic substitution to take place. So kaolinite has a smaller negative charge than montmorillonite, so the amount of charge is different. I've also added two other minerals because I think it's important to at least mention it. Um, there's two clays that fall into the oxide group of clay minerals. These are not clay minerals that we have by and large in our soils. We maybe have small quantities, but it's not the dominant clay. If we took a look at those clay minerals, structurally very different, um, they can actually have a net positive charge. So the way the substitution takes place is it allows those clays to have a net positive charge or potentially a negative charge. It can be variable. Silicate clays though, those are the ones we're focusing on. Those are the top three, kaolinite, illite, and montmorillonite. They have an overall net negative charge as a result of the unshared oxygen atoms and the isomorphic substitution. And the reason that we're spending any time at all talking about this is the fact that it's those charged surfaces that are essential to some of the processes we're going to talk about, especially related to plant nutrients and nutrient uptake. A lot of our plant nutrients are cations. So those are elements or ions that have a positive charge. And if we look at this list, things like ammonium and calcium and iron and potassium and um, so on and so forth. All of those are plant nutrients and because they're cations they'll be attracted, so opposites attract, they'll be attracted to those negative surfaces of those clay minerals. Um, there's also you know things that are toxic that will be attracted as well. Um, we'll sort of talk a little bit more about how pollution fits into all of this as well. Okay, because those clay minerals have a negative charge, they can attract cations. In the case of clays that have a positive charge, they could attract anions. But I would rather have you underline and circle cations because that's going to be the dominant process in our clays that we have here locally in the Midwest. Most plant nutrients are cations, so this sets us up well. We have soils that are negatively charged and we have plant nutrients that are positively charged. We have the ideal type of soils for storing plant nutrients. And we're going to talk later on this semester about pl how plants actually extract those nutrients that are being stored by the soils.